Dav are spending some time together in California. It's my understanding you have something to share about Autopia as per your uh, most recent trip to uh, Disney. Yeah, um, so a little bit of background. Autopia is Dav's favorite Disney ride. And um, so we uh, were trying to get him to, you know, have a little courage and go up to one of like the Disney cast members and ask if they had any Autopia shirts he could buy because that was his favorite ride. Um, However, uh, Dav did refuse to do this, possibly because he was nervous about, you know, talking to someone he didn't know. Um, And I I guess that's pretty much the story, right, Dav? Dav's like uh, eyebrow is twitching next to me. really like doing this right now it could be because autopia fucking sucks <laughs> yeah well you would know something about sucking wouldn't you you put it in your mouth and it goes there oh i don't remember the context for why i said that but apparently uh, i did say that at some point um i put it in my mouth and it goes there no, uh, I, I do think it's kind of funny, though, that um, when it comes to, like, a lot of Disney ride, it's like, oh, yeah, this one's, like, a B-tier, but, like, oh, we could probably miss it. But Autopia is like, yeah, this is one of the worst rides in the park. We have to go on it every single time. And I think that makes it That's very like, special. Autopia is, like, for piss babies. I'm not even, like, mincing words there. If you like Autopia, then fuck you. <laughs> Autopia sucks. Fuck Autopia. So, Dad, did you live out your dream of making a child... What was it? Making a child crash or something on Autopia? Uh, either that or, like, like beat one to death. That was also an option. You, you um, said you wanted to, like, rear-end a child last time you went on Autopia. No, last time he went on Autopia, he did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> there was, like, a kid in, Be like... Fair. In Autopia, it says, like, oh, no bumping, no doing that, and there was a kid in front of Dab that was going too slow, and Dab just hit the gas and, like, pushed the fucking kid along. It wasn't even too slow. Like, he just stopped most of the time. He just would sit there and wait for me to push him. Fair. I think a car accident would be, like, the most interesting thing to happen on Autopia ever. Yeah. Rev up those fryers and fill those champagne glasses to the tippy top. It's West Coast Toast and Roast with Tommy, Will, and Dad. Welcome back to West Coast Toast and Roast. I am fucking smart and know that the best ride at Disney is Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. And I'm Tommy. And I agree that that's a very good ride, but I would have to say my favorites are either the Haunted Mansion, which is unfortunately closed currently, or Indiana Jones Adventures, and I'm Will. These are also both good rides. It's Space Mountain. It's only Space Mountain. And I'm Dev. I like Space Mountain. I feel like it like goes real fast. I mean, it, like it goes real fast. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, when the roller coaster goes fast, holy crap! I just feel a little like Space Mountain is like over before it begins. You know, it goes real. It, it's uh, hard to savor. I feel similarly about like uh, Matterhorn. Uh, well, you haven't been on it the right way, then. Yeah. I think when you say that, I picture like Sheen and Carl and Jimmy Neutron when they're stuck on the ride, and um, like um, <laughs> in the first Jimmy Neutron movie when they're in the bad out of heck and they're stuck in it for like two like two days or something. Oh yeah, yeah, like, that, would, that would stuck, be great. Like, right in front of the Sasquatch with the glowing red eyes for like two days or so. That, yeah, that would be great if one day we got on Space Mountain and it never let us off. Yeah. We got stuck on Pirates of the Caribbean for a while. Um, and I think there's worse rides to be stuck on because that's a water ride, so it's like kind of cool and well insulated. Yeah. Uh, within like an hour, I started to like drink the lagoon water and I kind of hallucinated. Oh. Yeah, Tommy, that's why you thought it was an entire hour. You drank that as soon as we sat down on the ride. <laughs> 
I saw the visions of the scrapped Margot Robbie character in the Pirates reboot, and they kicked me out. Ah. Uh. Um. All right. You know, this was a pretty a lot of trailers came out this month, and I picked the worst movie one because you know the trailer for Alien Romulus came out this month. Which is crazy. I had no idea the Xenomorph was gay. Yeah. And the trailer for Beetlejuice Beetlejuice came out. It was crazy. I had no idea Beetlejuice was gay. Yeah. You couldn't tell? <laughs> the teaser for uh, Pines of Kindness came out, which is crazy. I had no idea those guys were gay. Oh. But we watched, uh, put all, take all that baby bullshit and put it in the fucking garbage. We watched first the trailer for Harold and the Purple Crayon, <laughs> in which Zachary Levi dresses as the titular Harold in, like, a blue onesie, and it's really fucking upsetting. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, this is an easy death. It looks like, I mean, obviously it, it's a weird adaptation, but on top of that, it just looks kind of bad. Like, it only showed, like, they were like, you can draw anything. And then that was the trailer. He, like, draws a plane and a, a dragon, I guess. He's on lava. It just does, it looks very bad. I wouldn't get, you know, it, this could just be a completely normal, inoffensive, like, kids movie. I The fucking trailer is like it's the fourth Lord of the Rings movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> big choir and the timpani and shit like no don't do that for <laughs> this 45 year old man dressing like a six year old baby boy shouldn't be doing that uh so that's an easy death from me um what I, I like knew i vaguely knew this movie was happening but all i knew it was just called harold and the purple crayon and i was like oh maybe it'll be like animated maybe uh and um and that, i saw zachary levi is like oh maybe he's the dad or whatever i didn't know he'd be fucking harold just like coming out of a portal oh man um it kind of gives uh grow up timmy turner which is like a very oh no, god for a <laughs> yeah but there's no advertisements for yakuza in the background of harold and the purple crayon so it's is that, it's so that something that happened it did happen in one of the Grow Up Timmy Turner movies. There was a there was a billboard for I think Yakuza Four. Jesus. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, everyone who says that we're living in Thirty Rock, the sitcom, is correct. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this will be death for me as well for uh, Harold and the Purple Crayon. Fatality. You. Sorry. I said fatality. 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 Take uh, take Clifford with you in the fucking Child's Book cinematic universe. Um, trailer number two was for a video game given a lot of press recently called Zookosis, where you are ostensibly taking care of a zoo, uh, taking care of various species (parenthesis crustaceans), and <laughs> apparently some kind of the thing thing starts to like fuck up the animals, and you've got to save them. It still looks kind of cool. I will give it a life, because I like an animal simulator, and getting to save them from a weird fucked up, like, vampire thing, kind of, you know, the, we've only seen the monster form of the giraffe so far that they use in, like, every trailer, but I kind of, I'm like, I kind of like that they're hiding all the others, but I also wonder if that's because they all suck. But it looks like this is, like, kind of low budget and just kind of taking its time. I don't think it has a release window yet outside of maybe this year um it's gonna be ostensible life from me um so first of all i think the concept is good but like when it showed the gameplay i was like i'm looking forward to never playing this game it just looks so like boring and slow which like i understand that it's like a you know zoo simulator so it, it should be a certain way but it just I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't look very fun to me, so I think great concept, but I'm going to give it a death because I don't think I would enjoy playing it. You don't want to take care of penguins? You don't want to name penguins? I do like me some penguins. Um, you like penguins? Yeah, you know, especially when they're cruising, but the this game just 
looked like very boring and not fun. So, I mean, maybe it'll like, you know, come out with trailers that show more stuff and that will be good, but for now it's a it's a death for me. It's also a death for me because uh it just kind of looks like another gimmick horror game that children are going to latch on to. I don't think it looks well, like it has a lot no of substance to it. There's no weird in this. I so disagree. I don't think you necessarily need a weird mascot for kids to get into something, but like... I feel like the thing with Freddy Fazbear and like Poppy Playtime is those are both characters that kids could like reasonably draw, and I just don't see kids like latching onto the fucked up thing giraffe that way. That's just me though. I mean, I don't think it's going to be like a, a Five Nights at Freddy's where it's like a big hit or something, but I think it's just gonna have like its fifteen minutes of fame and that's about it. So it, it might be like a Choo Choo Charles type thing where it comes out and that's it. <laughs> Alright, fair enough. I did uh with my students I have I read them a story every day and they have to write uh a connection and what the story is about and a lesson they learn from it. And I read them a story with a bear in it. It's called Tops and Bottoms, about a hair that tricks a bear. And one of my students said their connection was the bear reminded them of Freddy Fazbear. Yeah, Tommy, um, you're failing your students. The fact that you didn't, like, instantly expel that student is, like, you're part of the problem. Well, <laughs> don't speak too soon. Uh, the third trailer is Fallout. This one, I think it's going to spur in some interesting discussion. Uh, this is the Amazon adaptation TV series uh, based on the, you know, somewhat popular video game, one of the biggest video games ever. Uh, I've never played Fallout. It's my understanding, Dav, you have experience with it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess I want to hear from a seasoned Fallouter first. What are you, what are you picking up from this? Um, I mean... It- Aesthetically, a lot of things, I think, are pretty on point. Um, they're, you know, they're not trying to mcu anything. Uh, not that it really would need that, but, like, the, the vault suits and stuff look pretty accurate. Um, and I like the one ghoul design that we have, but I suspect there's not going to be many more than that, because it looks expensive. <laughs> so, that's a shame. Um... Beyond that, um, I don't know. It looks pretty standard. It looks like it's probably going to either suck or be like a 7 out of 10 at most. Um, I don't know. It, it's not really bringing much of anything interesting to the table as, as far as I can see. But who knows? Um, I am curious to see because this is like a new setting technically. They're in uh, Los Angeles now, so could be something. Kind of my understanding that. that Fallout is like it's not a game. It's like a game where you're playing from your point of view, and there's not really like a bunch of distinct characters to adapt. So they kind of have to like just fit their own characters into those roles. Am I correct in assuming that? Kinda, um, especially because each game kind of takes place over a pretty long period of time a lot of them can be pretty far apart from each other um so you know you'll have like your your vault boy mascot or something to hold on to there but for the most part it's like new characters every game the main protagonist is kind of just a blank slate so Mm -hmm. this is like all original Mm mm-hmm I kind of got to respect, because the showrunner was like, look, we knew you can't please everyone with this kind of thing. So we're kind of just going for it. And I have to admit, I really respect that, even as someone who got his goddamn panties in a bunch about the Game Awards Twisted Metal clip. I was like, you know what? Props. You know, um... And, you know, my excitement for the show is, like, a Scooby-Doo mask that you pull it off who it really is and it's that I like Ella Purnell the lead actress but you know what I'm kind of digging it I think it looks a little cool I'll give it a shot I've never played the games but I kind of like that they're easing us in to say it's kind of its own thing and it seems like that's how you would handle Fallout 
So it'll be life from me. Uh, Davey, did you say life or death? Uh, ultimately, I think I'm going to give it a death. Like, it's one of those things that's like, I, I'm sure there's going to be some horrible discourse created by this, no matter what. And I just, like, this, the show does not look all that interesting to me, so. Might uh, be more trouble than it's worth. Yeah. Um, I'll probably also give it a death because like I don't know anything about Fallout and I think the aesthetic is really good but like I don't really see anything coming from this like I can't really guess like what's it going to be about or like what's the thing like it, it does just kind of seem like oh they're, they're, they're having fun in the apocalyptic wasteland so death for me fair enough okay so we got pretty much rounded uh, deaths to life support. It happens around uh, this time. I guess we will dive into our tops. Will, what have you brought to the table first? Okay. <clears throat> so, while Dab was down here, we got to see uh, one of the most insane movie experiences I've ever experienced. That being Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Um <laughs> Uh, no, this is, like, a big roast, um, and I know sometimes, like, Tommy, you'll be like, oh, this movie was clearly written by AI. I think, like, more than ever, I realize that, like, okay, yeah, movies are being written by AI now, because this movie sucked, and it was, like, barely even kind of about Ghostbusters. So, in general, it's basically, like, there's, I guess, a old ancient wizard who can control the dead who is locked away in, like, a sphere. And he gets out and, like, unleashes the ghosts on the city. Which is uh, fine, I guess. Like, it's still kind of weird for Ghostbusters. But I think the biggest, like, thing that kind of encapsulates everything wrong with this movie is the fact that... There is a character in it whose title is The Fire Lord in a fucking Ghostbusters movie. Um, they like, you know, the first Ghostbusters movie was nice. It's like, oh, there are ghosts and they're like, you know, freaky little dudes. In this, you kind of don't even know what a ghost is. There's like weird potato creatures. There's like dragons. There's obviously like the ancient wizard. It just, like, it, it doesn't really make Lesbians. any... What's that? Lesbians. Yeah, also true. Um, it just, like, it doesn't really seem like Ghostbusters as much. They were like, all right, we need a sequel to Ghostbusters Afterlife. What do we do? Um, but just the fact that, like, you know, the first two Ghostbusters, and pretty much every Ghostbuster, it was always like, you know, you had your rules. But now we've got, like, this all-powerful ancient wizard and a dude that can control fire to stop him? Like, what the what the fuck happened to, like, oh, it's a Stay Puff Marshmallow Man? Like, that's the kind of stupidity I expect from Ghostbusters. This was, like, this was too much. This, was, this fucking hurt to watch. Um, none of the characters are good. Uh, the, the main story focuses around the little girl being upset that she can't, like, bust ghosts with her family, but it's like, yeah, no shit, you're 15. Like, that's not a... That's not a bad thing that you can't, like, endanger yourself at a, well, the a age family of... family that busts together. Yeah, well, I think this family should go bust. <laughs> um... But yeah, it, it was, uh, I, I know that, like, y'all have seen it too, so I want to hear your thoughts, but it was incredibly stupid, and I also think it's, like, another another thing is, like, they make a big deal out of the death chill. They're like, oh, this wizard is so scary, he could literally freeze you to death. But then, like, he can just freeze other things too, so it's clear that he just has, like, ice powers. So I don't see why that was, like, such a huge, like, thing in this story where they're like, oh, the death chill, he freezes by fear alone because then you think like okay it's setting up for like a later character to not get frozen by him because it's courageous but that just never happens and then in the end the fucking fire lord and the brass ghostbusters cannon take him down and it 
makes no sense and it's incredibly stupid. Um, think of it that way. But you're exactly right. That it's like, thank God the way we don't get scared to death is to have fire. Yeah, and plus, like, other stuff got frozen. There were, like, icicles in the beach and stuff. Does that mean the wizard, like, scared the beast, the beach frozen? Like, he clearly just have a, has ice powers. <laughs> it's fine to be like, he has ice powers. Or if you're going to do, like, a death chill thing, make it, like, actually make sense instead of just, like, he freezes people in their tracks by scaring them, and, like, also he can freeze whatever he wants, so... Does he just freeze, like, normal matter in another way? Like, what the hell? Well, like, you, you should introduce a character that has, like, an injury to their frontal lobe so they don't feel fear, so they can't get scared to death, and they're, like, the big deus ex machina. That would be... Wolf harder. That would be better than the fucking you are the fire lord. God, poor Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> Um, oh boy! But yeah, what did what did you think of it, Davey? Uh, I thought this movie was a waste of time, <laughs> like like usual with these. Um, you know, Ghostbusters is one of the franchises that I think is better off not existing anymore, <laughs> frankly, because like there's not really anything else to do with the formula. It's uh, it's a one-off kind of joke that works for a single movie, and uh, it really shouldn't go beyond that. But uh, this one, especially, really, it just feels like you're not there for anything. It's uh, boring, it's slow, it's longer than it needs to be, it's not paced well at all. Um, and yeah, like, like y'all were talking about, just the, the main antagonistic force is not super interesting at all. Uh, and there's not much to it beyond just the ice powers. It's kind of just the gimmick of the whole thing. And yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess this this movie just feels like it was made to print some more money because I'm sure it made and is making plenty of money because there's not much else showing. But because you are the fire lord. Yeah. I wonder. Is, did you see the red letter media video on it? No. They were showing like no one was going to going to see it. Maybe in certain... Let's see, I wonder if I can get the gross as it is at the moment. I mean, um, there was like no one in our theater either. Let's see. Uh, it is flopping at the moment. It has not yet made back its budget. What does it have and what does it need to make? So its, it's budget was $100 million. It is currently sitting at $68 million. Oh, oh yeah. And nowadays, you're not even a success if you make back your budget. You have to, like, double it, I feel like. Yeah, because of marketing. Right, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Faith and Humanity Restored. I'm glad people aren't showing up for this. Fucking, <laughs> it's as bad as I think the trailer's kind of set up. Like, if you uh, knew what was probably going to happen from there, that's all you need to know. Yeah. It's about as good as advertised. There was so much shit in Like, the fact that they brought over Podcast and I think her name's Lucky, and they, even though no, over to California when they all lived in, like, buttfuck nowhere in the last movie, so they all just moved in a big fucking caravan to be a family that busts together. Um, Aren't they in New York in this one? No, yeah, so they, in the first one they lived in, the in like, foreign country where they discover all of Egon Spangler's shit, and now they're in New York, meaning all of those unrelated families have all moved to New York, presumably. Right. Yeah, and those characters, both of them have, like, nothing to do in this movie. Um, uh, Dav, you have a comment about Lucky, don't you? <laughs> Lucky? Every time she's on screen, she's the horniest character in frame. So, I wonder if I, if I just have a dirty mind, or if I'm the person who caught this... Was that she's putting on her proton pack and she tell, look, she's like Finn Wolfhard's love interest and she goes, switch me on. And I have to imagine the line was turn me on and it like grossed people out or something. Uh, I mean, I did. Yeah, I kind of took that away from that scene anyway. Um, 
<laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't think she has a single line in this movie other than how much she just is fucking horny, which you know, good for her. Um, I guess that's an essential quality for a Ghostbuster. You have I, to at one I point thought, be able sorry, to fuck sorry. one of the ghosts. I thought they were going for like they almost seemed like they were going for a podcast and Phoebe Spangler to be a couple. And I, like, because it's very much reads, like, Phoebe Spangler wants to fuck that ghost. She wants to bust that ghost, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I took from it. Um, and it almost struck me like it would be a matter of, I consent, I consent, and podcast going, I don't, did being, like, the end game. <laughs> <laughs> um, but kind of, at least that didn't happen. Uh, podcast continues to serve no purpose. Uh... Uh, just as much as this movie I'm fucking tired I feel like Kumail Nianjani is like the one actor nobody ever knows what to do with like if you ask me what adjectives you cast Kumail with I'm kind of like if you do I feel like they always give him a character that they don't know what else to do with it's like well um if we're casting Patton Oswalt, it's because he's probably nerdy, awkward, and a bit excitable. If it's Kumail, it's because we don't know what the joke of this character is, <laughs> and he's going to be just kind of generally charming. You know, you know what I'm saying? Honestly, we, yeah. We have an Indian character, and we don't want to cast somebody who's actually Indian. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I can never not... I think he played a character... I wonder if it was, I'll probably cut this because this is maybe a bit racist, but I think he guessed it in Archer, and Archer called him Indian. He just smacks him up the side of the head and goes, I'm Pakistani, you dick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, Go Ghostbusters Afterlife is. Oh, man. it's What's really sad is it's somehow not the worst movie I've seen this year. It you mean really Ghostbusters is. Frozen Empire? Frozen Empire. It's all the same fucking. <laughs> Boneheads, Rise of the Fallen. Who gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> um, this move this year has sucked for. I I feel like you like I finally fall into the depths that you're both in, where it's like somehow this is maybe fourth from the bottom of my current ranking, and it it should be the worst. Yeah, it's uh, it's not good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Dune Two kind of sort of broke the curse sort like it's really good um but it is like the one good movie out of a sea of trash so far yeah trash and like mid-ish i've like even the, the most i've enjoyed is like either a streaming thing that's not that's like a festival darling that i can only kind of attribute to this year or like i don't know the britney spears song kung fu panda oh well Uh, do we have anything more to say on uh, uh, Frozen Bastard, Frozen Empire? No, Al. It uh, it sucked, and um, I can't wait to never see it again. And you are the Fire Lord. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I will pass it on to Dav or Dave. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm gonna start with a, uh, switching things over to a toast. I'm gonna toast the video game Helldivers 2, which is a very recent release that had a very rocky launch, to be honest. Um, mostly just brought on by the sheer volume of people trying to log on to play this game. Uh, but now that things have sort of calmed down, it's easy to get into a game, uh, all I can say is it's a lot of fun. Um, I really enjoy these sort of four-player PvE shooters. Um, you know, when they're not in an oversaturated market of just constant, we have a horror franchise, let's put four survivors against a killer and keep doing that over and over again. Um, so when it's something more like this, where it's like a, a horde shooter and it's it's kind of kind of reminds me of just the good old days of playing like Left 4 Dead 2 um, I think that's a a great thing to have when it's uh, a multiplayer live service sort of thing that very well easily could have fallen to like you know a suicide squad situation 
where the game is just doomed from the start. I think this game is actually going to last a while. I think this is an example of what to do when you're launching a live service game nowadays um, because it's just actually good. The developers clearly care. They're not trying to just rip people off. So I really appreciate that and I enjoy playing the game as a result. I've heard cool things about this. It's like very much um, Starship Troopers, right? Yeah, very heavily inspired by Starship Troopers because there's... Um, right now there's two different factions you can fight. There's the bugs that are... It's basically exactly Starship Troopers. And then there's the like cyborgs, the robots, that look very Terminator. And uh, I think they're adding a third faction in the near future that... Is That's it? called the Fire Lords. The Fire Lords. <laughs> no, I, I think they're supposed to be kind of like the Protoss from StarCraft or something, which could be interesting. I might went to, like, Predators. That'd be fucking cool. That would be cool, too. Um, but it would probably be difficult, because the, I feel like they have to be just trying to overwhelm you with numbers, because the game is just kind of built to be extremely chaotic like you're supposed to just be constantly calling in airstrikes and shit i see that i didn't know that they added cyborgs that piece it always sounded cool to me but i like that there's like different waves of fucking species you can fight yeah you fight basically like because the the whole game there's a big like meta game to it it's um there's one guy named joel who basically works as the game master and he kind of tweaks basically how difficult or easy certain things are like he can just change settings at, at any given moment um, because the entire thing is being played on like a simulated uh, collection of galaxies and oh that's fucking cool yeah kind of the goal is that everybody uh, b based on how good all of the players are doing against each faction can start losing or gaining sectors in the galaxies. Um, oh, fuck, I like that. That's really cool. So yeah, so like certain planets have been lost already, others have been starting to sort of get taken back, and so it kind of dynamically changes over time based on what this Game Master wants to do, and I think depending on certain things and, and certain victories uh, kind of drive how the, uh, the game is going to be further developed and like how they add to the story and mechanics and stuff yeah I really I oh sorry go ahead Sherm no, I was just saying I dig that go ahead Will I was just gonna say from what I've seen it just looks like a very fun game um, I've never been like good at shooters uh, so I don't know like how well I would fare at this um, but I think, like, through concept alone and, like, the fact that, you know, you're everyone's working together uh, does really intrigue me. And I like that you can, you know, kill the Terminator and, and bugs. Yeah. For freedom, of course. Freedom, for liberty, for controlled democracy, I think, is the, is the big tagline they throw around a lot. For bitches. There was a... Because the... I think the twitter account for the main developers or something uh they role play as like the actual like government in in the game um so i think it was like last week uh they i think one of the planets was lost to the bugs and um so they made an announcement like we are running out of space uh to put our colonies so we are now putting a ban on procreation for the next, uh, for like indefinitely until you get your shit together, and so the it, the headlines were running like Hell Divers Two bans sex after players lose a planet. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. That's a good way to have fun with the um, marketing. That's brilliant, honestly. Yeah, it's uh, it's very fun chaos and uh, kind of a a trend also uh, outside of the mascot horror games I think is sort of these uh, like Lethal Company just sort of these cooperative games where you're all kind of supposed to be working together but it's also funny how easy it is to not work together like it's so easy in Helldivers 2 to call in an airstrike and wipe out your entire team by accident <laughs> 
Uh, but it, it's just, it's still fun, I'd say, either way. Um, so if you go into it not taking it too seriously, I think you can have a very good time with it. What I like. That sounds really fun. I'm, I'm into it already. Yeah. Uh, I will pass it off to you, Tommy. Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to toast a show I've been watching. Uh, the new se- it was a uh, new season of which just hit Netflix. It's called Girls Five Eva. Um, because forever is too short is one of the taglines. Five ever. Um, it, it it was started on Peacock for two seasons, but recently moved to Netflix. And it is Tina Fey produced, so it's a little bit. Um, I think it has some of the same writing DNA as Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt and Thirty Rock which are all-timers in my book, and I think this one is just as good. It is about a bunch of, it is about a girl, a girl pop band who were a one-hit wonder in like 2002 or so, and now they're like 40 and trying to get their lives back together. Um, so I, I feel like we're in a field of the early 2000s finally being far away enough to like really brutally satirize. And I think it is a very easy period of time to satirize. Um, you've got like Sarah Bareilles, who I did not know was funny, uh, alongside all these really good comedians. And uh, it's just, it's the kind of show where every episode there's some parody song. Uh, not, well, not parody songs. It's not like they change the lyrics to a, something. A style but, parody. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Like, uh, I think uh, the one I think back to a lot is, uh, we're dream girlfriends because our dads are all dead. (laughs) They gave us advice, but we don't remember what they said. That is pretty funny. (laughs) Fucking great. And it's like, and in some way, it's a very thoughtful uh, satire as well thoughtful maybe is the best word it's not graceful but it is thoughtful because you know you there's also some spotlight on how young these ladies were sexualized and they're in their 40s and they're like you know it's really fucked up that there was a new year's countdown clock to when we turned legal shit like that <laughs> uh-huh. um it's very fucking funny and it just has like i feel like that i don't I say Tina Fey humor a lot because I think she produces a lot of these shows. Maybe it's the writers she's bringing along. I feel a little neglectful that I haven't gotten all those details. But just, like, really funny ideas for characters. Like, one of the band members is dating. When they ask her who she's dating, she's like, oh, he's a professional chef. But you see he's, like, um, he makes school lunches. So they're having candlelit dinner. and It's like a big wet tray of corn or something. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's very fucking funny. I really like the whole cast. It's, uh, you know, it just has those fast cutaways where you get some, you know, some glimpse of their fucked up career. I really like, there are girls five ever, but there's only four left. It's established that one of the five girls died in what they describe as an infinity pool accident. (laughs) Like the movie? Uh, yeah, no, like a literal infinity pool. Uh huh. <laughs> she's trying to get a good picture and fell over the edge or something. <laughs> um, and they try to bring her back to life with AI, like, but it's like they can only use vocal clips that she's um, like they can pull clips like voice clips from her interviews and stuff. And everyone leaves, and Sarah Burrell is like, I guess it's just you and me, AI Ashley. And she goes, now that everyone else has left, it's no fun anymore. And she's like, that audio's from your sex tape. Don't quote your sex tape at me, AI Ashley. <laughs> Fucking brutal. <laughs> I love it. It's just like extremely fast-paced comfort food show. That um, does sound like, like, very funny. It's hilarious. It's um, And it just strikes on these archetypes like that i feel like we don't uh like um i feel like there was a weird movement in the early 2000s not weird movement because it was very universal but there was like a weird (laughs) culture around both chastity and extreme sexuality like you have to use sex to sell but you cannot like let the public know that as a idol or a pop star you have fucked so busy phillips play character is like chastely christian 
but like hyper hyper sexualized um and constantly like she'll be like i don't know only half dressed in a music video and saying like and remember to check your bible shit like that <laughs> oh man that's still a big problem it's really in fucking Japan. Good. And if you like 30 Rock and Kimmy Schmidt, it's very much in the same family as those. Um, but maybe more geared towards, I'd say, people our age. It's terrific. I heartily recommend it. You, you mean you heartily recommend it? What did I say? Hardly. Heart, I, said, I thought I said heartily. Okay, sorry. Heartily recommend it. Uh, that yeah, that does sound really funny. I'll definitely have to at least check out the first episode. Absolutely, yeah. It's uh, yeah, it's all on Netflix or you know uh, other means. If that's giving you a hard time, wink, wink. I mean, Netflix can die. Uh. <laughs> all right, well, back to you. All right. Um, speaking of style parodies, I am going to toast Seth MacFarlane's The Orville. Um, the Orville is, or at least it starts off as, like, a Star Trek parody, um, but then kind of quickly moves into just, like, a very good science fiction show. Um, like, from a lot of, like, McFarlane's earlier jokes, you can tell that he really likes Star Trek, and he did cast himself as the lead in this, to be fair, um, but it's kind of, like, very unlike anything else he's done, because it has its, like, serious moments, and the serious moments work. Um, so, like, at the beginning, it's, it's just kind of like a bunch of McFarlane-isms, like, oh, I'm having sex with this alien, which is coming from its head. Um, and you're like, ha, 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 oh, that's so funny. And then, like, later on down the line, there's an episode where, like, a member of the crew who is a robot commits suicide because, like, the other robots of his, like, race did something terrible, so everyone hates him. And, like, the crew has to deal with the lack of him being there, even though his people did something wrong. And, like, he kind of, like, helped with that. Like, something like that, in the same show that, like, you know, they'll, they'll be... Like, you know, you know the McFarlane warbling, where he's, like... Uh, he'll say something, and then he'll be like, uh, you know, I, uh, and then, like, say something else. Do you kind of know what I mean when I say that? Uh, I'm actually, sorry, slow down a little. So, like, a lot of times, Seth MacFarlane will, will do jokes where he, like, says something, and then he'll pause, and then he'll see, say, like, I mean, or, like, you know, something like that. It'll be like, uh, what are you talking about, that we gotta get to this planet? I mean, didn't the the Flubelflorps live there? Don't they like uh like like? like... I, yeah, that is a bit of McFarlaneism. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But again, it's just like really good. It's a uh, you know, it quickly moves away from like oh Star Trek parody to just like really good science fiction show, uh, and it's cool to see Seth MacFarlane doing stuff that's like not purely comedic. Um. There's like a lot of. First of all, I would argue that it has the best uh, trans representation that I've, like, seen in media and, like, an episode that deals about that. Um, there's an episode where, like, okay, so there's uh, this species um, called the Mocklin, and all of them are men. And uh, being born a woman is seen, like, as a genetic defect, and you have to get that corrected. Um, so one of the, like the children of Mocklin is born a woman and without like their consent they like you know perform the surgery to quote unquote correct him and then later um as that character has grown up they embark on this journey of self-discovery like understanding like I've known something's been wrong since like I could even remember things and like eventually when they they like found out they're like yeah, this is, this is what has been missing. This is what, like, should have been me from the beginning, and I can't believe that I, like, wasn't allowed to be that. And it deals with stuff about, like, how, you know, um, one of her parents is straight up says, I wish you had never been born after she transitions. Um, and, like, the, the War Council of Mockless is like, if you do this, we're going to pull out of the Union and we won't have any weapons, so you have to... 
you have to like not do it, not let her do what she wants because we're like a bunch of like the assholes. Um, and I kind of feel like no show has done it better, like in in specifics for um, like that. I thought it was it was done really well, really tastefully, and um, you know, really from like a you know, it's funny to say with when there's aliens, but from a human standpoint, um, I oh, just I just like. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it just sounds like the best possible apology Seth could have made for creating maybe the most infamous trans character ever. Yeah, that's true. And honestly, you know what? All is forgiven. It, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, um, it's a really good episode. No, and like all the, like, I'm not even done with it, but every episode is just like super good. There's an episode where someone accidentally gets sent back in time. And when they go to pick him up, he has, like, a family and everything. But they're like, you can't do this. This will, like, alter the timeline. We don't really know anything about time travel. And the guy's like, just let me be here. I promise I won't do anything. I'll, like, just let me have my family. And they're like, okay, if you're not coming with us, then we're going to get you multiple years in the past. And so there's just, like, this look of horror that they're going to get him in the past before like any of his family happened effectively meaning that they will not exist and he just like falls to the ground and is like i'm begging you please don't do this and it's just like a a really like profound and good moment and it's kind of creepy too because they do go to the past and pick him up and he's just like kind of normal because obviously he didn't know through it but obviously you know something is wrong and they tell him and he's like oh i'm sorry i did that that was like super selfish of me and it's just like kind of the 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 idea that like okay yeah we we helped him back we got him here he's fine but like knowing what they did kind of gives more weight to it it's just like a really cool science fiction show um, I think the the first season can be a bit of a slog, but like later on down, I think it's like God, it's genuinely really fantastic moments. From what I've heard, it is set like spending one season making a good enough Star Trek parody to then basically have a blank check to make his own Star Trek episodes, and it just comes out really well. Yeah, no, I would love to see Seth MacFarlane. I mean, to be fair, his humor stuff is really funny. You know, we talked about Ted on the podcast. Um, but I would love to see him do, like, more serious stuff kind of like this. But, it's a shame he's in movie jail after, um, I don't know, if I, I tend to, I suppose, and yeah. a million ways to die in the West. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I will give a million turns to Dav. So. Oh, okay. A million. Let's let's go through every property I've ever experienced in my life and then do that like s- seven times. 55 burgers, 55 fries, 55 shakes, 55 hot dogs. Okay, uh, here's a good little discursive one. Um, I have been going through the Final Fantasy VII compilation. Uh, I finally be- got around to beating the remake and remake Integrade. Um, currently playing uh, the Crisis Core Reunion uh, just to sort of get myself prepared to uh, play Rebirth, which I've heard nothing but great things about. Um, one of the things that I did, however, to prepare was watch Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, uh, <laughs> I, which I know is a very divisive movie uh, among pretty much everybody who's seen it. It seems like everybody has a friend whose dad is obsessed with the movie for some reason. And uh, everybody probably also knows somebody who hates it. And to be honest, I think I'm going to go ahead and roast it. It was alright for the most part, but I also think that given the context of it, it may or may not be the prequel to Final Fantasy VII Remake um, adds some it adds some juice to it I think that makes it more of an interesting thing to go back and watch but I can't say that it really saves it from still being overall a pretty low quality experience um, 
But I know that both of you at least kind of like it, so I'd, I'd like to hear kind of from you. Um, yeah, there's a simple reason why I like it. Uh, because it's fucking awesome! <laughs> uh, and I rest my case. Yeah, it's so... Very much a, it's more than anything kind of a dude's rock movie, you know, Sephiroth and Cloud have, like, no fucking reason to be flying, but they just have, like, Dragon Ball Z fights, they're slicing up buildings, fucking wonderful, fucking great. Yeah, I, don't know I what you don't see. I do agree that, like, the story can be, like, flat sometimes, but I think that kind of everything else in it just makes it more than worth it, especially the fight at the end, which I would argue is, like, the, if not one of the greatest fight scenes in cinema history. It's very good. I do like the, the, the fight scene between Cloud and Sephiroth. I think that that is, you know, more than anything, if you don't want to watch the movie, at least go watch that fight scene, because it's, uh, it's very good. Um, it's animated well, and yeah, the physics are all over the place during the entire movie, frankly, but it's, uh, it's very cool to watch. Um, but I, I think what what this movie kind of lets down for me is both the role of the party uh, from the game just kind of being not even secondary, but very pushed to the side. They're, they're, they don't get a whole lot of screen time at all. Um, and what we do get just feels like it was... The writing was maybe a little rushed. Um, I, I feel like they could have done the dynamics better even with the time that they got, but uh, yeah, they're they're not that great. And also the uh, the titular Advent children are just kind of boring, and I don't care about them. And uh, their their motivations and and just the fact that they even exist, it it all kind of just adds a lot of weird implications, I think, to the story and just just kind of is unnecessary overall but it's you know um i think it, it's kind of a product of the time it came out where like the be shonen sort of style was like all the rage uh so that i think they're the product of that but uh, yeah overall i didn't like, like two or much. three sephiroths kind of that draw yeah but like with none of them being anywhere near as as good or interesting as as Sephiroth himself. Which is, to be fair, very hard to do. Uh, yeah, um, I do think there is a weird balance to strike, because, like, I remember so... I remember the Advent children themselves, but I feel like they had this challenge of, like, making them seem like viable threats without, like, to Like, the fact that one of them sing uh solos tifa with like little effort kind of blows honestly it's like you're not putting respect on the name of one of the the only og besides cloud who really steps out of line to do much and I, um i do think that speaks to the challenge like well if tifa won i guess if we wouldn't really take these fuckers seriously so it was uh you know agreeing just from that premise probably wasn't really a winnable situation yeah and like I said, that kind of ties back into just the the role of the original party members being not very great in this. Um, you know, if I didn't have fun spending time with them, then that, especially compared to like remake and what what that's been doing with them, which is a million times better. But um, I don't know. I, I guess not everybody hates it. Um, the animation is pretty cool, especially yeah. for the time. It's aged pretty well, I think. Oh yeah, nicely animated. Very, nicely animated, yeah. It's a very cool looking movie. Um, yeah, I do think it's a. Um, it was like kind of that weird whiplash of me, maybe being the first dubbed film I ever saw that was CG, and like just being thrown off by Cloud's lips not matching his words at all because <laughs> they don't have the same opportunity to match. Yeah. And the voice acting is all right. Uh, some are definitely better than others, but it's it's pretty serviceable. I think you know I, that was kind of prime four kids era, where they could have just butchered it, but it doesn't seem like they did. So I appreciate that too. Fair enough. Yeah, no, um, it is entirely a college dorm room cool fight scene movie. I wouldn't consider it, like, 
great film. So I, I'm not like clutching my pearls that you weren't crazy about it. So it's all good, you know. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and like I said, I think the the juice that got kind of gets added to it just from it being this bridge between the original and the remake uh, could be very interesting. I'm excited to see if Rebirth does anything with that. Um, Reboob will be back after <laughs> these messages. Uh, I'm glad people have been very good about spoilers from what I see. Like, I have not been spoiled about Rebirth, like, at all, and I don't know if it's just because it's so similar to the original game, or if people are just actually being good. Either way, I'm looking forward to that when I eventually get around to it. Um, but yeah, I will pass it back to you, Tommy. Righty. Um, I've also got a very divisive topic. Uh, you know, arguably just as, like, potentially prestigious and, like, earth-shaking as Final Fantasy VII uh, I have been playing and have kind of mixed feelings about Jet Set Radio. Um, oh, oh, let's hear it. Was, yeah. <laughs> Dab was kind enough to connect us all to his Steam account because they have the new family functions. So he's my new father and I play the games he's he's bought because I'm broke. Yep. Um, including Jet Set Radio. I noticed he had on there, and I was like, well, no better time to try Jet Set Radio for the first time. Did you play the I've tutorial? I've seen that guy in all the Sega crossover promotional materials. Sure, I'll try it. Might as well say I have. Is Jet Set Radio good? I don't know. <laughs> is Jet Set Radio fun? Kinda. Yeah. Um, it is a game on roller skates from the Dreamcast era. Just let that sink in. Whatever you're picturing and how kind of terrible that feels, yes. That is the reality of this game. Um, I feel like it is a bit of a hard game to return to, and it can be very frustrating, but I also keep picking it up, and I'm not necessarily hell-bent on, like, scrapping it anytime soon. There's some, I wouldn't say baffling design choices, because I think there was just certain points where everyone was just silly you so how it works is you choose an area and you are doing oh i forgot to mention the funniest fucking thing about this game is when you first turn it on the first thing you see is a psa of sega denouncing the act of graffiti in real life (laughs) (laughs) it is a fucking winners don't use drugs ass graffiti is art but it's also a crime Yep. It's fun in the game, not in real life. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what you're rolling with. Uh, you have to tag... So, you know, you're affiliated with a little skater gang in the loosest of terms, and you have to tag other people, other gangs graffiti with your own. But um, I feel like there's a bit... There's a bit of, it kind of fights you in that smaller items, you can just tag as you swing by, and larger ones you have to do directional inputs to, um, like, kind of QTE them up. And I'm kind of not sure if the, the, if the, um, directional controls, excuse me, were always kind of weirdly unresponsive, or if that might just be a translating to the Steam Deck thing. Because there are certain motions that, like, do not input the way you'd think they are. But I wonder if that's just... Because I don't think it's fully verified on Steam Deck. I might be wrong. Um, It does sound like it would be, like, a Dreamcast jank sort of thing, though. Yeah. I really... That's just as likely. Perhaps even more likely. And it, it does feel like a game that's, like, kind of fighting your momentum and precision. And when I look at review... Like... The tea I've kind of heard is that even people who love Jet Set Radio are kind of like, "Mm, it doesn't always handle the best. So I think that's the legacy it has. I think the most infuriating thing about this game is that you're you're in a big, not a big open world, you're in an open area, you select the area, and you have to, you know, cover a certain number of graffiti art pieces with your own graffiti. And I've gotten to the point multiple times where I've like, graffiti there's like a counter where it's like you have one left 
but there it's not like crazy taxi and i kind of where you are directed towards them as far as i've explored you don't get a map and even if it was like there's one left and you get a fucking crazy taxi arrow i'd fart like it's kind of infuriating when i lose because i've tagged everything except one item and i'm searching a kind of spacious fucking stage and just can't find the last thing and then time runs out that honestly like butters my biscuits not fun um, there's also the fact that in these open areas, you exit and quit by hitting their perimeter. You just exit down the alley. And if you go down, and it'll say exit this way, and you're like, okay, I'll turn around. I don't want to quit. There have been times where cars have been driving by in these streets, and I and they slam into me and fucking beats ass like is splattered on the windshield and he gets knocked over and the car carries me into the exit area of <laughs> uh, none of my volition okay that sounds kind of fucking hilarious honestly <laughs> that is, but I, like, undoes all of my progress and makes me quit and you do not it is not you hit that area and it says are you sure it's you hit that area and you're done <laughs> you went in there and you're gone yeah <laughs> Did you um I feel like, sorry. Did, did you did you ever manage to beat the tutorial to this game? Yes. How long did it take you? I remember the tutorial being fucking stupid. It took me like I maybe um cuz it's where you have to like mimic the tricks, right? Yeah. It took me, I failed a couple times on a couple of them. It didn't take me a huge amount of time. I just think it's funny because, like, Jet Set Radio is one of the very... I don't think I've seen this on any other game, but, like, the achievement that you get for completing the tutorial is, like, one of the less common ones. What? Because it's so fucking stupid. Like, most people don't want to go through all that. It is a fucking... It, the tutorial does suck. Um, it's a little too long. Uh, the signposting as a whole just is the, have you tried it is that why you're also asking yeah yeah i i have tried it yeah because yeah they give you like three very precise like it's like at first it's like do a jump or do a grind it's like sure then it's like now do these 10 steps in this very specific positioning <laughs> yeah it's insane but um no oh, yeah but like so i from what I know about Jet Set Radio, I think people are bigger on it its sequel than on the original. Well, I didn't even realize there was a sequel, honestly. Uh, Jet Set Radio Future, which I think... Oh. I think it's still locked to the original Xbox, though. Like, I don't think it's been ported to anything else. What the fuck are they... Because the, I have the same complaint. They have the first Crazy Taxi, and that's great arguably one of the best games ever just in of itself best arcade games ever i should say but like there's two sequels and it's like you know what would be great with this one map and four characters is all the additional maps and characters of crazy taxi two and three yeah and they're not on steam what what's nice about jet set radio though is that um bomb rush cyber funk which came out last year is like it addresses like every complaint you you've said so far about it and like corrects it and it's uh, you played it yeah i've I, and i beat okay. it and it's it's really good it's like everything jet set radio does but better uh in my opinion is there still like enemies in bomb cyber bomb rush cyberpunk um kinda it's not like a big part but there's like a little bit of combat yeah there's a truly another just like big misfire B because you're doing graffiti which as sega reminded you is illegal um there's cops chasing you at all time and i think once or twice i've sprayed them to get them to fuck off but you have to the only way to really get them off your radar is to get a certain distance away from them and they can hurt you and kill you you have a life bar so you're doing this like open open area assignment, like all it's a Splatoon-esque covering of uh, graffiti, 
while also getting hurt to potentially die and also on a time limit and no way and no easy way to really rectify those i was always kind of like i feel like if i'm doing all this graffiti i should get extra time as like a bonus or extra, you can get extra health but i should be able to directly fight the cops instead of always run away if i were in charge i'd spray them make it so you spray the cops with your spray cans and they turn fucking cool they're not fucking narcs anymore you get a can of narc away that is pretty much what bomb rush cyberfunk has uh number one there's no time limit on the graffitiing so you don't have to worry about that and it like you know it's persistent if you leave the area and come back you'll you'll still have everything saved but um the way that like the cops work is uh i guess kind of grand theft auto-ish where it's like the more you resist the the stronger that they'll send out at you but um yeah for the most part you can just fight them and then you can do the same graffiti on them that you can do like on the walls and it'll just knock them out well here i thought i was filtered but it sounds like someone has roughly the same idea as i am on how to make this game truly great yeah i i really do think that cyberpunk just does it all better and improves on it all uh and it's got you know it's got roller skates skateboarding and uh bikes so you can kind of switch styles they don't put in a razor scooter because that'd be like op like you could just cut up all the pipes ankles with a razor scooter and it would just be like wait you're out of here yeah um well if nothing else i kind of am excited to see what the uh, ostensible new jet set radio sega is working on is like and seeing how stubborn in their ways they may be. Will this be a Shenmue situation? Or are they going to borrow from, uh, you know, Cyberfunk and things like that? I guess uh, only time will tell. Uh, and that about wraps up my thoughts on uh, on that one. Well, wait, Cyberfunk isn't like a Sega game. It, it, that was like a third-party type yeah, yeah. thing, right? It's like an I mean, indie like, title. Sorry. But, th- but they could still take inspiration from it. That's true, yeah. 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 I mean, like, will they borrow things? Uh, you know. uh, will, are you ready to uh, start the last rotation? Yeah. Um, so, been making it through Doctor Who with Jay, and um, we reached the 50th anniversary special. Um, and I'm happy to say, because I remember watching that as a kid, um, and I'm happy to say it's just as good as an adult. Um, Doctor Who, I know in recent years, does not have a favorable opinion in the public. Um, but watching the 50th anniversary special just kind of brought back why, like, I loved it so much when I used to watch it with my dad. Um, and <clears throat> I kind of felt like, not a kid again, but like kind of close, like that level of excitement, just, oh, seeing all the doctors team up. Um, it's, a, it's a multi-doctor story, so it's got the Matt Smith doctor, the David Tennant doctor, and then it introduced the John Hurt doctor as like a version of the doctor that we never saw during like this great big war in which the doctor had to make the choice to destroy his entire planet um, with everyone on it of course. Um, and up until now, the series has been kind of building up to, oh, what, what was the time war? What happened? And this is when we finally get to see it. Um, and John Hurt as the doctor is really cool because like we see John Hurt's doctor in like the final few days of the war. And he's like a grizzled, like dying old man with like his face basically melting like you never see him smile and that contrast with like the younger tenant and smith i think really works because it shows that like yeah this was the doctor who like had everything taken from him and the doctor that had to take everything from everyone um so obviously he's gonna want to like get away and try to like live in a fantasy world where he's like the you know typical protagonist hero like he was with tenant and smith um really good like interactions between them all they're all very funny um matt smith i mean david tennant is incredible in everything and matt smith is um well i mean he's incredible in everything too especially morbius um 
But no, it's just like a really great like doctor story, but it's hard to describe unless you've like seen a bit of New Who. Um, but it, it does like, like even though I've never seen any of like the classic Doctor Who's, um, just watching like New Who and leading up to this special, you kind of get the weight of like how important Doctor Who is as a series. Um, you know, because this is like, this is a legacy and a character that has lived for like pretty much thousands of years. Um, and I feel like the, the consequences and the like interactions between the doctors as they're basically like, Hey, you know, it's kind of fucked up that we had to do this. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just work really well. It's a ton of fun. And, uh, I think it might be, I mean, technically it's a TV special, but I do think it's one of the best episodes of television ever made. Um, but I, I'm not sure that would be the case. But I mean, then again, you wouldn't watch like Ozymandias without watching the rest of Breaking Bad and be like, oh, that's a great episode. Um, but like, as till now, it's, it's, it might be one of my favorite like television specials, I, if not my favorite ever. Um, Dav, I know you used to watch Doctor Who. Did you ever get up to the 50th anniversary? I did not. I, I honestly checked out a little bit early on um, the 11th Doctor's episodes. It just, like, took a direction that I wasn't a huge fan of, but um, I still think that the, the idea of the special is pretty cool, because I was a big fan of, like, Tennant era. Yeah, Tennant and John Hurt, who died shortly after. Yeah. And that's all your fault, Tommy. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> um, I mean, he said he was hurt. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> John Hurt! Okay, John, let's just... <laughs> <laughs> Homer Simpson, smiling politely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's a, it's a really great story and kind of a great, like... A great like special about why the doctor isn't just like special in world but he's also special to like the people who watch him or i guess them now um because of the you know the the won't bbc <laughs> um but yeah i don't know uh tommy do you have like any experience with doctor who really no like yeah. i like I've absorbed a few tidbits from, like, mitosis. So, like, I, uh, his death battle appearance uh, and, like, the, the odd podcast tangent. That's all I really got. That's fair. Um, no, it is just, like, kind of in general a really good adventure series. Um, you know, it's, it's mostly episodic, but there are a few, like, overarching lines. Um, but it's nice that, like, it's... You know, it's a show that, that is mostly episodic, where it's like, oh, today the Doctor and their companion went to Alien Niagara Falls. And then, like, the next final two episodes of the seasons are like, remember that gem that they found at Alien Niagara Falls? That gem was actually the lost second testicle of the Doctor. And... <laughs> um... But, yeah, no, I think it's a lot of fun. Tommy, I think you in particular would probably really like Eccleston's Doctor. I think you would you would enjoy the show because it is a lot of fun, though. Okay, all right. I, I keep saying maybe I'll... And from what I hear, and I feel like I said this last time, you can just dive into any one Doctor and it just is what it is. Yeah, pretty much. And, you know, like, I'm, I'm almost positive that you would be like, Eccleston's my favorite. But, um... Do there... Okay. And I wonder if we're going to talk about because, like, I was just thinking the other day about how, you know, like, as a human being, I'm into so much shit that there's certain things I'm like, I know if I get into this, I'll be in too deep, and I just don't have the bandwidth. And like that, Doctor Who, Lord of the Rings, Dune, where I'm like, listen, it's not that I don't want, it's not that I have zero desire or I actively don't like the looks of it. It's that. I have days already where I'm like, it's too much shit that I'm into. I need to stop. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. Um, yeah. But if you ever get around, I'd say, like, even just one episode might get you hooked. All right, fair enough, fair enough. Um, 
so yeah, I will pass it over to Jav. Don't Google that. Um, okay. I'm going to go ahead and toast a horror movie we watched a few days ago. It is the found footage movie uh, The Borderlands, also known as Final Prayer. I guess depending on the region that you're watching it from. I think in America it's called Final Prayer because that's what we found it with on YouTube. Um, but as far as I know, the original name is The Borderlands. Um, and it's kind of a religious horror like a Christian horror, um, and the the main character is this uh, deacon who's with the church, uh, who's kind of going to this. Uh, he, I guess, his job is kind of to go to wherever a quote unquote miracle is reported, um, especially if it happens like on church property, <coughs> and basically disprove it. Um, because they, they want to be able to just get in and shut down any possible miracles that people say happen because that would just sort of devalue the idea of a miracle to them. Uh, so in this case, they got like a report um, that during a sermon at this church in, I think this is like somewhere in England, um, kind of in the countryside, um, during a sermon, stuff just kind of started going a little nuts. Like, stuff on the altar started floating. Uh, the priest started, like, chanting and, and claiming that he was looking at God. And then the the video footage got all corrupted. And, um, you know, the main character, you can tell he's been doing this for a while because he just kind of, like, looks at the video and is like, oh, okay, I kind of... I see what they're doing. You know, there's some wires over here. There's a, there's a blank space under the altar. And uh, he, he kind of just starts going through this routine of just like, all right, how do we figure out what this guy is doing just to like get attention from the church? And how do we shut it down? And just um, over time, they start learning more and more things about uh, the church. Like, it, it seems like it was built on uh, a pagan, like an ancient pagan worship site. And just sort of more and more as the movie goes on, uh, they start to sort of realize that, um, number one, it's probably not, the video probably isn't faked, and number two, it's probably still not a miracle, it's probably just something way worse than that, and, uh, that's, that's kind of the premise of it. Um, it's, uh... Like, I'm not usually a found fo footage horror fan. I think the highest I've ever rated a found footage movie is eight. Um, the ending of this movie and what it builds into, like, unnerves me when I think about it. Um, even if the, the beginning is, like, relatively slow, and, like, a lot of the stuff is just, like, oh, found footage, people talking to each other, the ending is, like, makes my stomach turn. It is one of the best endings um, in a horror movie, period. And I wish I liked the movie, like, up until then just as much, but, I mean, I like it regardless. Very cool. Um, I'm not normally a huge found, uh, found footage person either, but I've never... I do like... It kind of... By the sound of it, it gives a little, uh... Is it as above, so below? Is yeah. With the French catacombs? Yeah, very much so, I'd say. Okay, alright. And I kind of dig that one, so I might give this one a try. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot similar there. And it is, uh, it is a bit of a slow burn. I think everything just builds up perfectly to that ending. And, you know, try to watch it before you get spoiled on it, because it's, it's a very... Like, the ending comes out of nowhere, and it is just an insane. Um, it's lit literally just, like, the last couple minutes of the movie. But, like, it all makes sense. It's not like a... It was aliens the whole time or something. <laughs> no, yeah, they, they tease it and build up to it throughout the movie. Like, they're constantly finding, like, records of, of basically the history of the church and, like, what were previous priests doing and what is the actual history of the grounds. And, like, if you pay enough attention, it, like, it all builds up extremely well and it's just a big payoff. Um, but beyond that, I think this really hits home with me because just like as somebody who grew up around like 
you know, every week going into, like, a, a creepy old Catholic church, like, you build up a certain fear of just, like, the environment and, and everything that's there, like, I don't know, some of the most uncanny, like, weird feelings I've ever gotten in my childhood would be, like, I'm playing at the church and then I walk into the chapel and it's totally empty. That's, like, one of the creepiest places on Earth, like, genuinely. <laughs> If particularly pious people didn't want us to make horror of their culture, they shouldn't have made stained glass go so hard as an aesthetic. Yeah, and it, yeah, I just and I think this this movie really uh like really captures that fear. So I think anybody who's like me who like was raised in one of these places, it it will really hit for you because it's yeah, it's just all the creepiest things you could imagine happening at a at a at a church like this. Ali, well, that sounds fucking cool. Uh, I'll add that to my list for sure. Yeah, definitely check it out. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I got for that one, so I'll pass it back to you. Because I'm going to talk about people who have it way worse. I am toasting some aspects and roasting some aspects of Quiet on Set, the docu-series on Max that has kind of taken the world by storm about the truly fucked up working conditions of Nickelodeon Studios. Um, and if you're running similar circles to yours truly and present company, I think we always knew it was kind of an open secret that Dan Schneider is scummy and awful and a pedophile. I think we all like rad we all pretty gradually picked up on that. And it's been relatively common knowledge. So when I saw this uh, documentary was going as viral as it was, I was a little in a place of like, yeah, I know. Like, I don't think there's much new that you could teach me. And I would say I was proven fairly wrong. I think this is still worth watching. Um, I do think the most interesting narrative it paints is that in the early episodes, Dan Schneider is terrible from the very start, but it starts in ways of only hiring two female writers and putting them through some of the most arduous shit. And there's this weird, there's like, he would use early 2000s computer technology chat rooms and he would just send requests and it would just be, get up on the table and pretend you're having, you know, actually, before I go any further, trigger warning awful sex stuff i should say that first <laughs> skip to news if you don't want to hear that that's all over this you probably got the context but before i go any further uh dan schneider would send messages that say get up on the table and pretend you're getting anal sex and you know what it was so hard to get a hollywood job he was the you know, man in charge, and people would have no choice, like, feel as though they had no choice but to do it. Um, there was, you know, a time where he was like, I'll pay you $300 to eat two gallons of ice cream in 30 minutes. And this poor woman who was, like, making half a salary, because he halved the salaries of his women writers between, you know, was like, yeah, I'll do that. And she fucking throws up. And Dan Schneider, like, does not follow up on his promise of $300 or whatever. And then it, like, gets worse. And, like, because that's, like, all that era Nickelodeon. And again, if you're in our circles, if you're about our age, I'm 27, so I'm probably, like, 15, 14 when iCarly is at its biggest. And that's when all the strange shit in that show is happening and i don't know about you both but like i always um i always kind of like took it in as like this is maybe a bit perverse with the foot things and like the vaguely sexual things but i can't quite put my finger on it because i'm like kind of young i you age into Sorry. I, I was going to say, I, I did kind of get that feeling when I was watching it. Yeah. And then we age into when Victorious is on TV, you know, or maybe 15, 16. And it's like, do I have a, just a really dirty mind or should they not be doing this? 
do we share that experience? Uh, Victorious, I think, out of all of them, and I think Sam and Kat as well, were both, like, oh. they were way more explicit about you know, things that they were really on the down low about in, like, Drake and Josh. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and like, it's so insidious, because I'm, like, 16, and it's, like... I don't, I don't know if this is easy to take. Or, but like, I'm 16, and there's that one episode where they're, like, all in really revealing, like, swimsuits. And yeah. I'm like, I feel like I should... I feel like I'm getting away with something by watching it. <laughs> and there's... You know what I, I... Like, I'm like, well, this must be okay to watch because it's on Nickelodeon. But it's, and then it's like, you look back as an adult, and you're like, oh, that's fucked up they made children do that <laughs> um golly and like when they line it all up one after another it's like oh god we've been watching this all this fucking time it's fucking like you've got uh ariana grande squeezing a potato saying give up the juice <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny but it's insidious it's awful <laughs> um i guess uh and like I had no clue that there was weird shit in all that, because I watched that show as a kid as well. Um, but I was, like, young, young. Like, barely even aware. And I remember, and they covered, there's a sketch called Sugar and Coffee, where there's two just big clear glass canisters up in the air, and the two kid cast members, which, one pours sugar, and one pours coffee. And they just, like, get, gulp it down into their mouths from these big glass pipes and as a kid i think nothing of it i don't think that for i'm a kid and as an adult i'd be like oh i doubt that's actual sugar hitting them like sand i bet it's like prop something or other stand in safe to consume whatever and the kid who did it was like that was real sugar pouring down on me and congealing in my mouth <laughs> And making me choke on stage. And oh my like, god! Jesus Christ, like it's congealing. It's and they like show the detail. It's like why? How? Who? Could, like, what I like about this documentary is they interview mo the cast is who should be telling a lot of it and the people directly abused. But they had prop people come in, and there's this guy, never been on TV in his life, mustachioed kind of guy in his 50s or 60s, who's like, I was the prop guy, and I always thought the shit Dan Schneider was asking me for was weird as fuck, but I was never allowed to, like, ask about it. My bosses were like, no, it's what he wants, do not. Um... I'd say my point of contention with this documentary that I'm growing a little uneasy about is how it handles Drake Bell. Because you're probably both aware they've brought him on and they got his story how he was assaulted by Brian Peck. And it is a harrowing story. And I'm all for Drake telling that story. It's like, maybe, you know, he pretty much the whole third episode of the docuseries is Drake Bell explaining Brian Peck. And how, like, you know, poor Drake Bell's poor father always saw, like, that Brian was weird and, like, not acting in a kosher way with his son. But from the sound of it, Drake Bell's mom was, like, so I want my son to be a star that she wouldn't do anything about it. And fucking Brian Peck, straight to hell, like, manipula he that's where he's headed manipulated drake into like severing ties with his dad the more suspicious he grew and it comes to a point where drake is assaulted as a child and you're pro you've probably seen the clips he's drake refu he says imagine the worst thing that could happen and he crosses his legs in the foot it, it's awful it's terrible what kind of puts me in two minds of it is that this has been a lot of good PR for Drake Bell and he just I think last week released a new music video and I think we're all aware that Drake Bell while you know not is guilty of crimes of his own he has apparently been inappropriate and has been guilty of endangering children as well 
and you can tie that as well we see perhaps what caused that but the documentary really i don't feel it holds him accountable for those they gloss they mention it i was kind of waiting for we need to address drake's own baggage and they very passively mention it and seem very intent on giving drake a platform again with no no strings attached in that regard and that actually really disappointed me all things considered i'm not you know i don't know how what the appropriate approach is to like let a victim speak out but also you know make sure folks are aware that you know we aren't necess- we shouldn't necessarily be lionizing his big comeback because he's kind of got his own shit to answer for i don't know (laughs) for sake of covering bases i'm obviously not certain of all the details of his situation he kind of goes on record saying there was misinformation i think that in a documentary about listening to victims it lionizes someone who seems to have his own victims a lot and we're already seeing ripples where a popular public opinion is well we, we we don't need to be mad at drake bell anymore or we don't need to hold him accountable this explains it he says himself it's not so bad that's why i feel very torn about that that makes sense i get what you're saying um God, i i haven't seen the documentary so i'm not sure i can really add or like you know like uh elaborate on any of your points But I do agree that, like, you know, like, number one, this information did need to be, like, out in the public. Um, Oh, yeah. But I do agree that there does need to be, like, some accountability as well. Hmm. I know, I think they said they're going to do an extra episode focused on Drake. And I kind of wonder which way they're gonna t- if they kind of realize eh, we better talk about this some more uh what kind of platform drake's gonna have they're very damning of a lot like they showed people wrote letters in support of brian when he was you know rightfully accused of sexual assault and they put people on blast as they should for writing letters of support and it's people like Ryder strong and Taryn Killam. But if they're so intent on that aspect, I can't help but feel it it may say a lot that they do kind of gloss over, uh, you know, Drake's Drake's own difficulties and give him honestly a lot of um, a lot of leeway to pave his own narrative that not everyone that they put on blast in that documentary, again, rightfully, that they do get you you see what i'm saying yeah i get what you mean Mm -hmm. but i do recommend people watch it because i do think it is the it does just make you think about how careful we need to be if we need to we don't have very much control over this but just being aware of the media we consume and like more and more and more i'm kind of like it should just be a bit evil to have child actors or at the very least there needs to be more measures in place about it yeah some types Um, of laws yeah uh you know um dan schneider's trying to do damage control you might have seen that fucking tebow from icarly of all people (laughs) had him on for an interview and gave him like the mildest slap on the wrist and it was kind of frustrating um you know, you've, yeah, you've probably heard all about this. I think that about covers it. Uh, I do recommend... It is a fascinating watch. I will, I would also call it a well-made documentary in of itself. They do some really interesting framing. Because um, I do think it's easy to say... You know, easy to make a documentary that is a documentary. But this one actually does take some good techniques to have a narrative... And I think that sets it up in quality of how it delivers its information. But as I've gassed on about, I just feel that information is a little incomplete. Well, yeah, I mean, I think if you want, like, a really good, um, like, just a single point of view on this whole mess, uh, read uh, I'm Glad My Mom Died, the Jeanette McCurdy So fucking good. It is, it's really... 
like it's not just about Nickelodeon, and it doesn't. It honestly doesn't touch on the Nickelodeon stuff in a lot of depth. I'm sure there are legal reasons behind that, but like, what it does touch on is pretty harrowing. And just overall, I think it's a very good perspective of just a child growing up in this horrible, horrible environment. Ugh. The number of times I just had to like put that book down and like process what that poor woman went through, like honestly. <laughs> yeah. Not late. Yeah, yeah. Um on that note, uh do we have anything else to add before I uh whisk us away? Uh I, not for me. Nope. Alright, alright. Um, weird month for news. I feel like there's so much shit here that we... I feel like I say this every month. That's like, oh, we could easily say, we don't care, and we'll move on. But feels... Okay. Let's take this kind of seriously. This could be so easy to fuck around with. WB has shut down Rooster Teeth. And yeah. now, um... No matter how... Rooster Teeth, always a company I thought I was kind of sus of. I, I actually will never forget logging onto Twitter and hearing about Rooster Teeth layoffs and seeing one of its big influencers who at that time I kind of admired just saying like I feel like this is a new era for Rooster Teeth like just being so tone deaf and that being such a huge moment in me getting so fucking like disillusioned with all of it so I you know you might have heard me shit talk Rooster Teeth in the past I'm not gonna celebrate a bunch of people losing their goddamn jobs and i hope they all bounce back yeah i've heard nothing but horror stories about like even just like working for them before all this happened it sounded like it was a terrible workplace yeah yeah there was some there was definitely someone like had to i remember because i still avidly watch and you know if they find a way to continue i will watch uh death battle uh i like that show a lot and I know they had to, were going to do a red versus blue crossover like a few years ago, and they announced it and had a date and everything, and they just suddenly delay it because I think one of the big voice actors in that did a sex pest. Am I correct? Sounds right. Yeah, I know quite a few of them were exposed for that like a couple of years ago. Hmm. So. Yeah, it is weird when like a structure like Rooster Teeth that I think gave. I think it is, you know, relevant to what we were just talking about. It's a weird halfway point between indie company and still a corporation where people you don't want to have power have a lot of power. And for that, I've always, you know, kind of jeered at them. I, you know, for what, you know, for whatever content people see value in, a lot of little guys got hurt by just more really sweeping, uh, baby in the bathwater mentality by Warner Brothers. Um, and that's really unfortunate, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do we have uh, Oppenheimer sweep at the Oscars? John Cena was naked. Do we have much else to cover there? Uh, did you guys hear about that slap at the Oscars a few years ago? <laughs> so funny. Yeah. You know what? Uh, it was John Cena's ass cheeks when he walked on stage naked. Yeah. They slapped. No, I mean, they should have recreated that with exactly what you're describing. I think that would have been fantastic. Um, and they well, should well, they should sorry, do the same thing one, to Jeff Keighley. Are you saying one of John Cena's butt cheeks walks up to the other and gets offended and slaps the other? No, but like... Jimmy, what is it, Kimmel? One of the Jimmys, he, uh, Alan Kimmel, I can't. He joined straight. in on that bit and, like, didn't add much. I think he could have added a whole lot with just a big old spanking, you know? <laughs> well, we're going to go to hell when we die. Um, uh, but congrats to the Godzilla Minus One team for... That is a big one. Yeah, that that's well-deserved. Because with how, like, allergic to franchise stuff the Oscars are, it does go to show that Minus One is just this, like... Like, it's a piece of film that stands on its own as, you know, frankly, a masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, for all the franchise fatigue we get, they're kind of showing you can still do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, I, feel, I feel fucking stupid bringing it back to franchises because it's a great achievement, but, like... There's a kernel of truth to what I'm saying. That it's not that we're sick of franchises. It's that 
we're sick of bullshit. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and Godzilla proved that that shit can still be fucking good. Yep. The CGI in the Furiosa trailer looks bad. I'll beat your fucking ass. Come on. (laughs) Um... Uh, okay, well, mostly you and me, but maybe Dav caught wind of this. We got a really, we got finally the unveiling of some actual gameplay for um, Fatal Fury: City of the Wool. Um, I kind of got the sense you weren't as hot on it as I am. Uh, yeah, but it looks good. I think it looks fucking great. Um. But the gameplay looks fucking great. Um, I like the the rev system. Looks like it's a good uh, new little implementation. Um, uh, new character. Uh, oh, what's her name? Freesha? Is that her? Uh, Something like that. You like a Joe Joe Higashi disciple. She's Joe's disciple. I'm gonna say it. I always felt Joe kind of took up space. I like this girl better. Oh, be, yeah, that's a that's a very unpopular opinion. People, like, love Joe. Yeah, he's fun to play. Little Muay Thai guy, number five. I guess, he, I, I just, like, you got, in the history of Muay Thai guys, you got Sagat, you've got uh, Bruce from Tekken, oh, and then we got Joe. That's just me, though. That's just me. I'm the guy who could leave her take Jack and Tekken as well. Okay, um... Uh, silly, weird thing. Not weird thing. Do we want to talk about Late Night with the Devil and the whole AI thing? Um, I think we can talk about it this. Uh, with, or rather, just with this. For the people at home, the movie Late Night with the Devil is using AI in its movie. And uh, as someone who is a performer that has, um, you know, seen the backside of what AI will do if it's widely accepted, do not see this movie. Um, It's no movie is good enough to normalize AI images because if we look past it this time, it's gonna like it's it's just it's gonna be a thing. And I, I don't think that can happen really appreciate your point of view in that regard coming right out of uh, the VO industry Uh, I think you speak to it better than anyone could oh thank you Um, I would say this is that what I see the attitude I see a lot is oh are we really gonna boycott an indie movie and go through a big movement through this small thing and my what frustrates me about that mentality is that it's like okay, maybe we're not necessarily boycotting. I can still personally make the choice not to see the movie. And if enough people feel turned off, then yeah, that's the result. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, no, I, I agree. Maybe I agree. We shouldn't necessarily arrange a boycott, but it's like if enough of us don't want to see a movie with a stupid-looking AI image, then enough of us speak for that, and that's just the way it is, you know? Yeah. But uh, I'm looking forward to watching it illegally because, um, <laughs> well, I mean, like, normally I would be like a jokey, like, oh, ha, ha, watch it another way. But, like, AI art is theft. If you put that in your movie, you're stealing to put in your movie. So, therefore, you shouldn't feel bad when people steal your movie to watch it. Exactly. Right. Um, and there is an ask. There is. And we talk about this all the time. Like, bring in the stamp. I want the non-AI stamp at the end of the credits. Uh, I bring it up every time, though. I won't gas on again. Um, Kind of something just for me. Seth Rogen is writing and producing an R-rated animated Venom film. Oh, Uh, fuck yeah. That sounds awesome. Fuck it. It's wild that we've never had a Venom movie before. Like, this is oh. Rogan's gonna bring us our first Venom movie. Fucking insane, right? Yeah, I wonder if he'll, like, have a theme song for Venom that's, like, a rap song, too. Venom, Venom. <laughs> I will eat that shit up. Like, I... You know, you know what? Invincible, The Boys, Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, and it's so neat, so maybe some Spider-Verse DNA in there. Uh, my mind's kind of racing, wondering what the fuck this could be. Especially if it's going to be R-rated, like he promises, because we need more R-rated animation, too. That sounds 
cool as fuck. But honestly, um, yeah, big agree. It, if you build it, we will come. Um, I hope it doesn't get dead in the water. I know he was working on a Figment uh, uh, film about the Disney character Figment that we haven't heard about in a while. Maybe it's supposed to still happen. I trust that maybe it's because he looks like me and talks a little like me. I would trust Seth Rogen with my fucking life. Um, <clears throat> he just does great stuff, in my opinion. I let, He always, even if it doesn't always hit, like The Boys has weird hiccups, I see a lot of, like, intentionality behind his work. He never comes in just to, like, just for the sake of it. It's going to be interesting if it's not at least pretty or very good, I think. Yeah, big agree. Um, Dev, are you ready to play Marvel Overwatch? No, fuck that game. <laughs> Aren't they putting in, like, a gotcha character as, like, a guest? <clears throat> Uh, that sounds like something they would do, but I haven't caught wind necessarily if that's the case. It looks like Slob... Uh, I mean, like, especially compared to the fact that they just announced another Marvel game that looks... Uh, you know, from what we've seen of it, looks pretty incredible. The 1914? Is that what it's called? Uh, some Something like that, yeah. I, I almost wanted to do Life or Death with that one, but, like, I, w I try to hold myself to wait for actual gameplay. Yeah. Um, that's what I'm kind of anxious to find out, but I agree it, like, looks fucking stunning. Yeah, honestly, like, the facial tracking and the... I mean, all of it is extremely impressive, but um, that's not going to, like, if it's a crappy game other than that, then obviously, but um, just... It's promising so far as opposed to this game coming out of the gate just looking like a piece of shit. <laughs> oh, I'm a little drawn. You know what? There's there's kernels. Of, I, I like that you play as Bruce Banner and you have to turn into the Hulk. I'm like, it's cute. But, like, the Overwatchification of it all kind of reeks and it's going to be free to play, which is like... Oh, the end. Uh, that's not good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Waifu Galactus is there. Uh, whoever drew that character, I know what you are. <laughs> um, that's about all I have. Did, did either of you have news to bring to the table? Uh, not really. Yeah, not that I can think of. It's, uh, not been... It's, it's been a bit slow. Yeah. Yeah. Well... There's been, like, I feel like there's been a new news bulletin every day, but it always sounds like a... It's always an, oh, that's the real discuss and film moment. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, it's, uh, like, a billion people cast as Among Us guys. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, the Among Us animated movie or whatever. All their casting choices for that just coming out. Peter Griffin met Stitch today, because Disney Plus and Hulu merged officially, and I think they, like, met in an ad or something. Oh, good for them. <laughs> Yeah. Ooh, we. Um, there's one. Yeah, uh, they're making a sequel to John Tuck. I feel like I need to keep the. Have you seen the clip from the bear where it's just Jeremy Allen White shouting, "Shut the fuck up while he's cooking." Uh, I have I not. Want to, I want to quote like nine out of ten discussing film posts, just out of like, why is this happening? Because <laughs> they're making a sequel to John Tucker Must Die. I think we're just like too far gone. Well, uh, I am getting ready to see, uh, what's, uh, let's see, Ghostbusters Frozen Empires, Offshoot, um, Californians, Rise of Fred Armisen, and I'm Tommy. Uh, and I am looking forward to the Ghostbusters spinoff, Ghostbusters, The Fire Lord, and I'm Will. <laughs> oh, they would so, like, make a... They would so make a Fire Lord, like, spin off. Like, he's the guy. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. I'm looking forward to meeting all the ghosts from that movie when I inevitably run out of insulin. <laughs> and I'm Dev. Oh. Good night, everybody.